I am General Paul D. Hawkins, commander of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. Here today, the U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines are joined together in a common effort to help this country. Nowhere in the world today are we more aware of the inseparability of the problems of a people involved in fighting a war and building a nation than in Vietnam. For here is the rendezvous of all the historical forces in this century. The communists have long sought a takeover in Vietnam, and the first phase of struggle after World War II resulted in the North-South Petition directly reflecting our divided world. Now, this young nation remaining on freedom's side is engaged in a war which is as hidden and stealthy as it is relentless and exhausting. Responding to the request of the Republic of Vietnam, the United States has come to help, as we have helped and are helping all free people who seek to defend themselves from the communist scourge. The U.S. effort to our Vietnamese allies is a vast and comprehensive one. It involves political, economic, psychological, and military measures. All of the armed forces of the U.S. play a part. Because our efforts here are so comprehensive, the whole story cannot be told in 30 minutes. Today, our focus is on the U.S. Army Special Forces, one important part of our overall effort. During the next 30 minutes, you're going to meet a remarkable group of Americans. Members of the United States Army's Special Forces on duty in South Vietnam. The Republic of Vietnam, on the eastern edge of the Indochina Peninsula, is about as far from home as an American can be while still on Earth. When it's 7 o'clock in the morning here in Saigon, it's 7 o'clock the previous night in New York City. Army Special Forces were sent to Vietnam because they're experts specialists in training men to fight a special kind of war. It's a dirty war, fought without uniforms on a battlefield without boundaries. A war where the friendly farmer you pass in a rice paddy may become the murderous enemy the instant the sun goes down. Sunset is beautiful in South Vietnam, but then night comes, and at night in Vietnam, men die. The communist guerrilla lives off the people, by persuasion if possible, but if propaganda fails, by terror. Fear and propaganda have turned the isolated villages of Southeast Asia into a theater of war, a war which can only be won or lost by the villagers themselves. What Americans can do is combat fear by giving them guns and the training they need to defend themselves against terrorism. And we can reply to the propaganda by actions. We can bring to these remote areas some tangible proof that the way of life we propose is a good life, worth fighting for. This is the story of a small group of Americans who are quietly trying to do that job, now in the swamps and jungles of Vietnam. sizes, wearing different labels. But one thing they all have in common, the innocent suffer. The guerrilla warfare being conducted against the Republic of Vietnam by the Vietnamese communists, the Viet Cong, isn't new. We saw it with minor variations in China, in Malaya, in Greece, in the Philippines, in Cuba, in Laos. 
It's a kind of war which recognizes no non-combatants. In Vietnam, the communist guerrillas promise progress, yet their favorite targets for assassination are school teachers, doctors, engineers, anyone trying to do today what they promise for tomorrow. Life will be lived on their terms or not at all. What happens to Vietnam will depend in the end on who wins the villages. And the government of the United States has determined that it won't be communist guerrillas. This is Major General William B. Rawson. He was then a brigadier on a recent visit to a strategic village high in the mountains of central Vietnam. As special assistant to the chief of staff for special warfare, he has come to inspect the village defense system, established here by a 12-man special forces team, a handful of Americans who in a few short months have converted a remote, guerrilla-infested highland plateau into a major training center of anti-communist tribesmen. We asked General Rawson to describe the war in Vietnam and the role of the Special Forces soldier. There are many terms which might be used to characterize the conflict now occurring in Vietnam. For the general public, the best known probably is guerrilla warfare. However we refer to it, there can be no question that armed insurgency on a large scale is taking place aimed at the destruction of a people's national independence. It is the policy of the United States government to advise and assist the people of the Republic of Vietnam in their struggle to defeat the communist insurgency which strives to eradicate their freedom. The American soldiers you will see in this film are part of our assistance effort. As members of the U.S. Army's Special Forces, they are among the most highly trained military personnel the world has known. Each of them has been trained in a variety of skills which in more conventional organizations would be distributed among two or more individuals. These soldiers possess the capability of going to remote, primitive regions of the world to live with the people, eat their food or share their lack of it, learn their language, their customs and taboos, and win their confidence and respect. The future of such areas as Southeast Asia ultimately may be determined by events taking place in remote jungle villages which appear on no maps, by acts of violence occurring only under the cover of darkness, by wars which can be won or lost before the world is aware that a war has even begun. This film documents a small part of what the armed forces, and particularly your army, is doing to assure that such conflicts wherever they may be forced upon us, can be resisted successfully by ourselves and our allies. I'm Captain Ron Shackleton, detachment commander of the Special Forces personnel in this area. American advisors first began laying the groundwork for village defense in this region in September 1961. At that time, the villagers in this area were almost completely defenseless against the predatory tactics of the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese communists. Out of fear, these mountain people were forced to both feed and house roving Viet Cong patrols, and their young men were often forced into Viet Cong activities in order to protect the lives of their families. Our effort during the months we have been here have been to teach the mountaineers who call themselves the Rade people that they are capable of defending themselves against such tactics, that they need not be afraid. We have shown the Rade how to build stockade type fences and how to maintain 24 hour security. This is Master Sergeant John Slover, who has just returned from observing a patrol. Through an interpreter, he will comment on his observations. 
Not all our advisors rely on interpreters. Here we see Sergeant Bill Belch instructing the carbine in fluent Vietnamese. They are called Sun Carabin, La Ka, Bamoy, Chucky, Hau, Lap, Vatau, Kosung Nai. Toy Sata, Nai Kwa, Vanyung, Tin Kaik, Kur Kosung Nai. Moon Banchet, Moten Kwan Dik, Kaik Kakain, Kala Chung, Vacham Tuk, Tidok, Vay Kosung Nai. Nyung Sahan, T. Chakla Kong Dok. Yama Tung Tung, Chang Yung Kuvak, Nitenai, Nila Zung, Ala Konyo K. Thì thường thường không trông thấy sao được. Thế thì nếu một tên con địch gần. Basic instruction in the care and use of a weapon. Familiar to any veteran of the U.S. Army. In this class, one of our raw day instructors is teaching his men a technique in search and seizure for arresting Viet Cong agents. Many such agents conceal themselves in friendly villages disguised as ordinary workmen. These men are from surrounding villages. They have come to our village seeking training which will enable them to provide their own defense against guerrilla bands. It is not unusual to see 200 or more of these people each week. Outside the village gate is a sign which says, here no Viet Cong need apply for rice or any other assistance, that this is a free village which is no longer afraid. We have taught our friends small unit tactics and given them modern equipment with which to defend themselves. People who once defended their freedom with a crossbow are now learning to use rifles, submachine guns, and grenades. Dajang. Benjang. Ma patangan. Ma. And up and up. Now. E bat. Bat. Da, dua, 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 da, dua. Today, these Rade people, who are in some ways very primitive by American standards, are among the best anti-guerrilla fighters in Southeast Asia. As our program expands, new special forces teams are moving into other villages, always with the same goal, to teach people who value their independence how to preserve it. Okay, Odie, your boys got all your equipment, you're all set to go just about now, aren't you? Okay, fine. Well, you know that we're going to have trouble to the south. When we first set the circle up up here, uh, VC didn't know what we were doing. And it took them about a month to really figure out just what we we're about to do there. So uh, when we move to the south, they already know just about what we're going to do. And once we start building up the same <coughs> defensive systems we had up here, they're going to try and hit us as soon as we start. So we're going to have to watch that. Well, already for the past couple of weeks, you and your team have been here observing my team work with the Rade people in village defense. You've been exposed to some of our training problems, our logistical problems, and some of the problems that arise from working through interpreters. If there are any questions that you or your team have at this time, or any other way that we can help you, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Ron. Uh, the last two weeks have been very beneficial as far as we, our team is concerned. We've learned a lot, as what you mentioned, the interrogation and so forth, and the 
uh, training with the Rod Day, working through the interpreters. There's one point that you can't help us with, though, is on this field headquarters there you've got set up. Uh, where we're going, we'll probably be working decentralized training rather than centralized, and the results you have may help us down there. But, uh, when we go to the other area, I'm afraid that we're going to have a few more problems down there that we don't have here. For example, a different tribe, and plus we're working with two different types of group of people, Dips and the male tribe. And we can take what you have given us here and then modify it to meet the situation down there. As far as equipment-wise, I think we pretty well got everything you had. Uh, how about uh, lesson plans and uh, training schedules there? Uh, we're okay on that, but we'll probably have to make some changes as our situation goes along. Okay, Van, how about the combo situation? Uh, it's pretty well in hand? Well, we'll try the same system they're using here. If that don't work, we'll change it. The villages of Southeast Asia were old in the days of Julius Caesar. Throughout their long history, they have been regularly conquered, oppressed, liberated, and invaded again. In the best of times, lives here are neither long nor easy. Maybe it's not surprising that the villagers of Vietnam have simple ideas about what makes a friend. Friends are people who help. Medics of a rather special kind are part of a special forces team to care for their own men. But in isolated, often disease-ridden hamlets where no doctor has ever gone, a special forces medic with his extensive specialized training may be the only contact with modern medicine the people will ever have. The use of military personnel to win friends as well as to fight is gaining ground in Vietnam. A villager is likely to be more interested in a new roof for his house than in the outcome of the Cold War or the threat of communism. The training and advising of Vietnamese civic action teams for work in the villages of Vietnam may be one of our major contributions to the defeat of communism in Southeast Asia. But if good works are an answer to communist propaganda, they're not enough to repel the guerrilla terrorism which invariably follows when propaganda fails. This is the village of Huk Thien, near the coast of the South China Sea. By refusing food and volunteers to Viet Minh guerrillas, these villagers subject themselves to 250 guerrilla attacks in five years. That's an average of one a week. They're about to show an American visitor how they survived. A typical alert, which here is more often real than practice. The village has been organized into a small fort. When the alert sounds, every man, woman, and child has either a place to hide or a post to defend. They've defended it so well that guerrilla attacks have virtually ceased. The price of extorting food and supplies has become too big for the guerrillas to pay. And it's worth remembering that they did this all on their own. Americans are now giving them weapons and technical advice. But in this case, we're only making a good thing better and maybe making life a little easier for a town full of brave people. All the bravery in the world won't win a war from behind a stockade fence. Sooner or later, you have to take the fight to the enemy, whether he's an army or only a band of guerrillas prowling the surrounding jungle. At a special forces training camp outside Saigon, volunteers from the village of Huk Thien are training to carry their war outside the gates. These training missions can be interesting. jungle is never safe. And when you practice searching for gorillas hiding in jungle villages, you're always liable to find some. In this 
school, nobody has trouble keeping the students awake. A moment's carelessness can lead to disaster. You don't cross a clearing, pass a temple, or walk through a cemetery without making sure. Natives of the Vietnamese highlands have nothing to learn from Americans about jungle living. But they do need help in mastering the tactics and using the modern weapons which communist trained guerrillas are using against them. people everywhere, they are natural soldiers who learn fast. These are men of the Nung Chinese, training at a special forces camp near the town of Da Nang. They are already some of the most experienced anti-guerrilla fighters in Southeast Asia. In 1954, 25 of these same men turned back an assault by 1,000 Viet Minh soldiers, killing 600 in the process. These are mountain people of the Katang tribe. They and their U.S. instructors are drawing rations of dried shrimp and rice for a week-long jungle patrol. A joint training exercise with soldiers of the regular Vietnamese army, it will have the added practical advantage of making life difficult for a battalion of Viet Cong guerrillas who happen to be using the same jungle. The main problem in taking the fight to the guerrillas in Vietnam or anywhere else in Southeast Asia is terrain. Ordinary means of travel are too slow to counter the hit and run tactics of communist guerrillas. One answer to that problem is the helicopter. Helicopters manned by pilots trained to fly at treetop level can bring troops into a guerrilla-occupied area the moment their presence becomes known. The helicopter also increases the staying power of the anti-guerrilla patrols. With fresh supplies of food and medicine available in the heart of the jungle itself, patrols like these can cover a lot of territory, stay until they find what they came for. guerrilla is beginning to learn that there are fewer places to hide in the jungles of Vietnam. Some of the Viet Cong guerrillas are hardcore communists, prepared to die for a cause in which unfortunately they sincerely believe. includes men, many of them, who only want an alternative. Men like this young Rade tribesman, 
who a few days ago deserted the guerrillas and came to a special forces team seeking protection. His name is Trung, 22 years old. How long has he been with the VC? Damlan a dog from Viet Minh. Dog Viet Minh, Damlan, Nan Sa, Nan Tua. He has been with the VC two months since January. Why did he join the VC? Sing a clay in a dog of Viet Minh. Dog Viet Minh, good as in your mouth, go, the common now in year. He joined VC because VC forced him, forced him to go in jungle. Why did he desert the VC? He deserves VC because he does not like the life of VC. And he threats badly many people steal right and work hard. But why did he come to our specific training area? He come here because he knows that program in Burning Now is for Rade people and for Rade benefit and he wants to work here to help Rade people to have better life. How large was the group of VC that he was with? Dem Chau Pung Viet Minh Bet Hong Eh. Viet Minh Dok Bet Kau Pa Plu Chau. Forty people with him. It will be a long while in Vietnam before any swords are beaten into plowshares. But the time will come. What the people want is peace. Peace and a chance for a better life. The communist Viet Cong promises them progress. But in the meantime, creates a world where peaceful citizens must go armed in fear of their lives. is power. What he can't control, he tries to destroy. In South Vietnam, the old promises don't work as well as they used to. And so the guerrilla resorts more and more to terrorism. Is at war with his own people. The Vietnamese are an ancient race and an independent one. This is not the first time they've fought for the right to decide their own destiny. For 2,000 years, they've defended that right against all the emperors of China, against the cavalry of Kublai Khan, against modern armies using machine guns and airplanes. Given time, they will send today's would-be oppressors to join the others in defeat. Our purpose in Vietnam is to give them that time.